All right, so whenever we start a new system, we always kind of talk about what functions it's carrying out. So what's the whole point? What does the cardiovascular system do for you? What are functions of the cardiovascular system? Delivers its nutrients and removes waste. Yeah, totally. So uh, let me spell correctly. You know, delivers nutrients, also oxygen. You know, takes away wastes. How about other things? What are some other other jobs this thing does? Uh, thermoregulation. Yes, thermoregulation. Um, when we start talking about blood flow that goes to different parts of the body, you can change the amount of blood that goes to the surface like right in your skin by like 50 times. So if you need to cool off more, you can send a lot more blood to the surface where you'll radiate out more heat. If you're trying to stay warm, you can keep the blood closer to your core. So thermoregulation, I'll just kind of put, you know, delivery of hormones. That's another big one. And we saw that, um, kind of got introduced to that idea with adrenaline or epinephrine. You know, if it's a way to put a signaling molecule and have it just get distributed everywhere and any cell in your body that has the appropriate receptor is gonna, again, then it's gonna respond. Um, and we're gonna talk about the immune system in way more detail, but we can introduce it here. This is kind of like a staging area for the immune system. This is where a lot of the white blood cells that are, you know, your body defenders are hanging out, zipping around. Um, they actually detect chemical messages. Like if there's some infection happening, they'll actually grab onto the wall of your blood vessel and ooze out and just get into the tissue spaces and start fighting. Um, that being said, there's a whole lot of, I mean, when we talk about white blood cells, you know, the, a lot of your white blood cells are not in your bloodstream. They're in um, the lymphatics and lymph nodes, just running around, um, traveling through tissue spaces. So, you know, white blood cells are definitely not confined to the cardiovascular system but it is a place you find them and it's kind of, like I said, like a staging area. So these are all things that your um, cardiovascular system is taking care of. Um, when we talk about this idea of, wait, somebody, I think Amy, you gotta mute you. That's better. All right, so what did we learn about diffusion? Remember when we looked at, we had our like Petri dish and we put that little like methylene blue in the middle there. And then we waited while the, you know, it started diffusing further and further out and looked at the rate that it's diffusing. Y'all remember that experiment? Yeah. So what did we learn about diffusion, how fast diffusion is, especially as you start getting further and further out? Depends on the size of the molecule. So one was it depends on the size of the molecule. The rate of diffusion was dependent on molecular weight. The diffusion, was diffusion very good if you wanted to move like more than a few millimeters? No. It was really, really slow. Remember with 
after hours, after one hour, the methylene blue had only gone, say, like a few millimeters. So if you, there's somebody did some calculation once, like if a cell was like 10, you know, 10 centimeters in diameter, that you would literally have to wait like months before the oxygen would, you know, if you had oxygen out here, you'd have to wait way too long for it to actually just by diffusion get to where it needed to go. Um, so as soon as, so if you're a, like an amoeba, you can let diffusion bring the oxygen where it needs to go. But when you want to be a big animal like us, then instead what happens is you end up being multicellular, lots and lots and lots of cells, little cells, and then the whole system of blood vessels that carry the oxygen and nutrients within a fraction of a millimeter of every one of the cells. So the actual amount, the actual distance that the oxygen and nutrients have to diffuse is actually really small. And the convection, the flow through the bloodstream is what's taking you across the long distances. So you take the flow through the bloodstream to get close to the cell, and then the last few fractions of a millimeter, like the oxygen can diffuse out of the blood vessel, out of the capillary and into the cell. Um, again, we're going to look at that process in way more detail in the respiratory system. That's called internal respiration when the oxygen leaves the blood vessel and goes to the tissues. So, you know, as you would imagine, you got to have a whole lot of blood vessels if you are going to bring oxygen and nutrients within a fraction of a millimeter of every single of your trillions of cells. There's somewhere around 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels. You know, if you are still kind of in the, in the um, regular system of, or kind of imperial system, that's like 60,000 miles. That's, that's a lot. Um, so just kind of putting that out there. Um, there are three main concepts that we need to think about when we're going to analyze fluid flow. And we're, this is basically kind of the physics. This, you know, this, this class has chemistry, this class has physics. Um, we're going to get into the basic relationships of blood pressure, blood flow, and we have to define more formally what are these terms, like when we talk about flow. So blood flow is going to be defined as liters per minute that are going past, you know, in, in some pipe or going through something. So flow is not velocity. Or speed. It's not how fast it's going. It's like how much volume per uh, unit time. So for instance, I can have, let's, let's make the pipe black so it's actually more, here's some, here's some big pipe. Here's uh, a little pipe. I can have blood coming out, bloop, 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 bloop. And maybe it's coming out at one liter per minute. Back. That means if I wait one minute, I will fill up, you know, a liter thing. If I have one liter per minute flow in here, in this much smaller pipe, I'm gonna have to have the blood coming through way faster. Whoosh. 
you know, but it's still going to ultimately fill up my thing here one liter in a minute. So this is way faster. Same flow. So just so I don't I want to make sure you get those two concepts as separate things. Now this is how again if you're you're trying to like everybody's done this probably you take a garden hose it's got a certain flow certain amount of liters of water per minute coming out of the end of the hose and then you put your thumb over the tip which is basically doing this reducing the aperture which means that the water has to come out way faster to maintain that flow it means it goes way farther before the gravity pulls it to the ground so this should feel kind of intuitive just based on this idea of taking a hose and trying to spray somebody. Um, so that clear flow, flow is going to be a super important idea in the class. Um, another super important idea in the class is going to be resistance to flow. And there are a few things that cause resistance to flow. And we need to look at all of them. So again, we have some kind of, some pipe, some tube. And you know, the blood is flowing through. What kind of things will affect the resistance to flow? Like how how hard it is to kind of be pushing the blood through there. The walls are lined with, I don't know, fats might make the... So what's, hap so what's happening, so when people do have like atherosclerosis and they have those plaques and things, what's happening is it's narrowing the diameter. Yeah. So a big thing that affects the resistance to flow is affected by diameter big time. And let's so let's 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 drill down into this one first and then we'll come back to a couple of other ones. So resistance to flow affected by the diameter of the vessel and it's not just it, it's not just kind of affected. It's really affected, really strongly. Um, so basically, resistance. Let's say R be the resistance is proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So let's look at what this means. So let's say I have I have yeah, I have my pipe here. So let's let's draw this a little different. I'm going to have a silly goose. Here's this pipe here with some radius r. I'm going to have a pipe, or I shouldn't say a pipe, a vessel. This is going to be um, one half R. Let's, that's a little, yeah, that's about right. So this is R. This is, let's say, one half R. This one here will be even like one third R. So I have three pipes, or three vessels. Each one is smaller than the, the previous one. If the resistance for this pipe, this vessel is R, what is the resistance to flow for this one that has half the radius going to be? Anybody? Two times. 
So if you look here, it's going to be proportional to the inverse of the fourth power. What is the fourth power of two? What does fourth power mean? 16. Exactly, 16. That's two times two times two times two. This is going to be 16 times the resistance of this one. So it's not just like twice the resistance, it's 16 times the resistance if you have half the radius. What if we have a third of the radius? What is that gonna give us? What's three to the fourth power? Oh, 81. 81, right? It's three times three yeah. times three times three, or nine times nine. It's 81 times the resistance of our original vessel. So this is really important to see here that the resistance to flow is really strongly related to the diameter of the vessel. Um, in a few moments, we're going to be seeing that this is one of the main ways that your body um, adjusts blood pressure, at least in the short term, is just by changing the diameter a little, which changes the resistance, and we'll see that is going to affect the blood pressure. So really important resistance to flow, very strongly affected by the radius, the diameter of the blood vessel. Um, all right, what other kind of things affect resistance to flow? Viscosity. Exactly. So one is the diameter of the vessel. Two is going to be viscosity. Right, think about if you're sucking a milkshake up through a straw versus sucking like a soda up through a straw. It's way harder to try to get that milkshake up. Um, in general, you know, viscosity comes into play like if you're really dehydrated and you're, um, you know, your, your blood is starting to get kind of more sludgy because there's more cells compared to the plasma and stuff and you can increase the viscosity, make it harder to keep it moving. Um, blood viscosity is a little more complicated than just like a milkshake. Um, there's a whole field called like blood rheology. Um, it's this kind of non-linear non thing that happens like your blood cells when the blood slows down, they start actually like sticking together. So you end up getting, um, they're called rouleau. So there's basically this it's kind of like static, it's an electrostatic thing where the little blood cells start assembling into these little, um, these little, it's like stacks of lifesavers or something. Um, but then once the blood is flowing, they kind of break apart and now they're just kind of individual little cells tumbling. But when the blood slows down, they start assembling. So the viscosity of the blood is not just a measure of you know how much stuff for how much fluid it's it's also like if it's slowing if it's flowing slower or faster it actually affects the viscosity um, we are not going to look at this beyond me just mentioning it i just you know if you go deeper into this field you'll probably have to learn more about this but just going just putting it out there that um, blood flow and viscosity is 
is more complicated than just like a normal kind of fluid because you've got this whole like kind of nonlinear thing where the little cells are assembling and falling apart depending on how fast things are going. So we are not going to talk much about viscosity beyond what I just said. And then the last thing, the length, total length of vessels. Obviously, if you have to send blood through way, way more miles of blood vessels, there's going to be overall more resistance to flow. Um, this is going to come up really importantly when we are comparing the systemic to the pulmonary circuits of circulation. The systemic circuit has way, way, way more um, blood vessels to supply all the different parts of the body compared to the pulmonary circuit, which is only supplying the lungs and coming back. Um, so we're gonna have like four or five times the resistance to flow in the systemic circuit compared to the pulmonary circuit. And that's gonna be important in a few minutes. Okay, so we've talked about flow, check, resistance, check. Then the last thing we need to talk about is pressure. So pressure is, it's ultimately a force over an area. Um, and the pressure is kind of what's keeping the flow going. So I usually think about, so here's my flow. There's some pressure difference between the two sides. If the so again, pressure is basically a force per area. So there's a force. And as long as there's a force is more on one side than the other side, you're going to have this bulk flow where things move that way. Um, pressure and flow and resistance are all related in this really simple equation. So I'm going to say BP for blood pressure. And basically the flow is going to be it's going to be the blood pressure divided by the resistance to flow or we could also say the blood pressure is going to be the flow times the resistance. So these are both the same things. These are just two, um, you know, two ways of writing the same equation. Both of these are going to be really important. Um, we're going to come back to these again and again and again. And again, they're simple, just multiplying and div dividing. There's no, nothing, nothing tricky about them. It's pretty intuitive if you think. If you think about flow, if you're increasing the blood pressure, you're going to increase the flow. These are directly proportional. Um, we saw that in our blood pressure lab when, you know, when the subject is exercising and you need increased flow to go to the muscles, you had to increase the blood pressure. Um, it makes sense also that assuming the pressure stays the same, if we start increasing the resistance, the flow is going to go down. If resistance goes up, then we need to increase the pressure if we want to keep the flow the same. So definitely look at this equation and make sure it feels kind of intuitive. Um, this one here, we'll use a lot as well. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the ways that your body regulates blood pressure. And the two main things that it can do is it can adjust either resistance or flow. Either of those will affect blood pressure. We're going to see one of the quick and dirty ways your body has to increase blood pressure 
is just constrict the blood vessel, right? Because if, again, if we kind of go back here, if you have a blood vessel with a certain resistance and you constrict it, all of a sudden the resistance goes up. And as soon as the resistance goes up, the blood pressure goes up, assuming that the flow is staying constant. So we're going to see that a lot, blood, pr blood pressure being regulated in the short term by adjusting the diameter of blood vessels, which then is changing the resistance. And again, because of this relationship, it's affecting blood pressure. Um, like I said, over the next, um, this, over this entire week, today and on Wednesday, we'll be coming back to both of these equations when we're trying to understand the relationships between these three, these three um, parameters. Okie dokie. Um, let's go back to the basic circuits that we talked about last time. Yeah, I don't have to go into all the details as much since we've seen this already. Um, so <laughs> let me draw this better. Here's the heart. Again, two pumps side by side. You know, a real heart is more complicated anatomically in terms of how it's shaped and all that, but it doesn't matter for this class. Um, we saw there was this main artery that leaves the heart, goes into the systemic circulation. It's the systemic circuit, it's in the blood. Again, remember that whenever you have something leaving the heart, it's an artery. Then we have this area where you exchange things between the blood and the tissues. And we'll look at those in way more detail. Um, but those are going to be the capillaries. So your materials can enter and leave the blood, the capillaries. Then we can continue on. On the other side, again, typically after the blood has delivered oxygen, we draw it as being blue, blue meaning deoxygenated blood. Um, as we get deeper into this, you're going to find that actually the blood that's returning from the body is actually still holding a whole lot of oxygen. Um, in general, the blood only delivers maybe a quarter of its oxygen and comes back just to you know, top off again. Um, again, we're going to look at that in more detail as we go on. Blood comes back, comes into the right atrium here. Again, this is the vena cava. Any th time we have things that are returning to the heart, those are veins. Um, but remember, it doesn't have to be red or blue. Like, so for instance, right now I have the blood that's now going to go off to my lungs. Here's capillary bed. Here are my lungs. You know, this, these vessels here going, these are my pulmonary arteries.
and they are blue, right? So arteries can be blue if we're on the pulmonary side. Once we pick up oxygen in the lungs and we come back to the heart here, to the left atrium, this is my pulmonary veins. So here we have red, bright red veins because the blood returning from the lungs is full of oxygen. So make sure you re realize that veins versus arteries is just about returning versus leaving and not about oxygen or not oxygen. Um, while just for completeness, while we're doing these circuits here, um, there's two other kinds of circuits we need to talk about. One is the heart muscle uses a lot of oxygen to keep going. So your heart starts beating even be while you're, as soon as you're like a ball of cells, like this like pre-embryo inside the womb, as soon as the ball of cells is big enough that diffusion isn't gonna work anymore, you need to start having some rudimentary heart starting. And that's going to be starting, you know, in the very beginning of development. And actually, as the pre-embryo starts turning into the fetus and everything, it's kind of crazy. The heart has to start developing into a mature heart while it keeps pumping. It's kind of a trippy thing. Um, people have done some calculations that over the course of a lifetime, your heart beats something like 3 billion beats. I think that I think that's what it is. Um, it's do I have that? I don't have it written here. So it's it's crazy. If you think about something that you buy, like a toaster or a TV or something that is going to keep working for like you know keep doing the same thing three billion times without wearing out it's kind of amazing more people actually live as long as they do um so your heart is working it needs lots of oxygen and nutrients to keep squeezing you know from the moment you're developing till the day you're dead so there is a collection of blood vessels that come straight off of the so this, this main artery that leads to the systemic circuit is the aorta. I'm sure most of you know the aorta. But right off of the aorta are going to be these blood vessels that then serve into the heart muscle itself. So they're called the coronary arteries. So basically, the heart makes sure that the first thing that gets blood is the heart itself. Because if the heart is not going to be getting what it needs, then it's not going to be able to pump and the rest of the body's going down as well. So little taps coming straight off of the very base where the aorta leaves the heart actually go back to serve the heart itself. What do we call it if these coronary arteries get blocked? It's a heart attack, heart attack. So when someone's having a coronary or, or a heart attack, a heart attack is just the coronary arteries that are blocked, which means the heart muscle is not getting what it needs. Um, there are two different things that can happen here when we talk about like heart attacks. Um, you can have a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, like we had for when we talked about strokes, transient ischemic attack just means that ischemia is lack of blood flow. If you have a lack of blood flow, but it's transient, and then the blood comes back, you can have crushing pain. They call it like angina pectoris. 
but you know the heart muscle gets blood flow again before there's any tissue damage. Um, if the blood is blocked for an extended period of time, you start having the um, heart muscle actually starting to die. Um, that's when you get like what we call myocardial infarction. Kind of MI. Infarct is the kind of dying of the tissue. So this is worse. extended deprivation of oxygen. All right, so that's the basic idea. Heart attack is when you are not getting enough blood to supply your heart muscle. If it continues long enough, you're going to start actually having heart muscle. Myocardium is just the heart muscle. We're going to talk about the myocardium in more detail. Um, as we go on. All right. So coronary arteries, um, another circuit that we will see later is, um, in fact, we might as well just add it in now, is the idea of portal systems. Like I'll add in the hepatic portal system here to make, make this more clear. So for instance, it's not always going to be having, you know, blood going out to a capillary bed and then hopping into a vein and coming straight back to the heart. Sometimes there is going to be two capillary beds and that's going to be a portal system. So an, an, an example, I'll give you one example now, we'll see some more later is the hepatic portal system. So this is when the blood goes to your digestive organs and picks up the nutrients and stuff from your meal. That blood doesn't just then go back straight to the heart. It actually goes to the liver, to some more capillaries where the nutrients might get processed, detoxified, stored. So what you get is a system that looks kind of like this. So what I'm drawing here now, so this is going to be, this is going to be called the hepatic portal system. <laughs> yeah, you're going to, I can't get to that because there's a little button there, but you can, get it. Um, so basically, there's going to be a first capillary bed. But that's going to be in my digestive organs. And that's where we're going to pick up our nutrients. And then the blood continues on into a second capillary bed. Which is ultimately going to drain back. So the second capillary bed. So basically, oh, you goofy thing. Okay, so we have our first capillary bed in the digestive organs where we pick up our nutrients. The second capillary bed in the liver where those nutrients are processed, again, stored, detoxified, whatever. And then you finally send the blood back into the um, veins that are going to return to the heart. So this is a portal system. 
And again, I wish I didn't, this wasn't so messy here. Um, portal system. Like, in fact, this vein right here, this is called the hepatic portal vein. The portal vein actually enters the liver, whereas the hepatic vein is the thing that leaves the liver. Um, and again, we're going to see a couple of other examples of these, of these um, portal systems later. But for right now, um, you should know about the hepatic portal system. All right, so I'm going to now erase our hepatic portal system because I want to be able to talk about some more stuff. Dr. Aker, in a portal system, um, do the vessels automatically become veins as soon as they leave the first capillary bed? Um, yeah, they're veins, but they're portal veins. So then they're heading okay. into an, a second capillary bed. Okay. Okay, so when we look at this picture here, there's a couple of things we need to think about. Which side is going to have, um, well, let's first, let's talk about flow. Let's, I'm going to introduce this idea of cardiac output. Cardiac output is going to be cardiac. Um, I was so happy because the looked pretty, but it was not the right word. Here, cardiac output, known as CO. This is the um, liters per minute you know, flow out of either ventricle. So you might wonder, like, what do you mean out of either ventricle? So, so first, let's just make sure you get this idea. Cardiac output, this is, and this is going to be our, when we talk about the whole big system, like the body as a, as a whole, um, cardiac output is kind of the flow of blood in the big picture of your cardiovascular system. And if we go back to my picture here, whatever flow you've got coming out of one ventricle is always going to have to be balanced and equal to the flow coming out of the other ventricle. And so let's talk about why that is true. Basically, any blood that comes out my left side comes back in the right side. Anything that comes out my right side is actually coming back on the left side. So with every heartbeat, everything you push out on the left comes back on the right. Everything you push off on the right comes back on the left. So if the cardiac outputs were not balanced on the two sides, you would start actually building up back pressure on one side or the other. So So that's important to, to, um, to keep in mind. And probably not just balance, I should must be equal. Must be the same. If they're not the same, you start building up back pressure. Um, if you are building up back pressure, you get into what's called congestive heart failure. So congestive heart failure. Um, Let's say you had the um, right side was pumping, was pumping harder, was more efficient, pushing more blood out than the right side. The right side was 
not able to keep up. And so the right side is trying to push the blood out, but the left side keeps pushing more blood in here than it can actually push away. You're going to start building up back pressure over here. That would be what's called like peripheral congestion. You start getting excess pressure here. You start getting fluid fill, um, leaking out of the vessels into the tissue. You start getting edema because now you have more fluid in the tissues. So congestive heart failure, you can have peripheral congestion. You can also have pulmonary congestion where you are having the right side, which is working harder than the left side. So the blood's going out to the pulmonary circuit, but it's not getting efficiently taken up and getting you know, pushed out to the systemic side. So you get the back pressure on the pulmonary side and you can get um, pulmonary congestion. So I can, you know, it's just called congestive heart failure. This, you know. So basically the heart is starting to not be able to pump efficiently anymore. And so now you're having back pressure building up on one side or the other, one circuit or the other circuit. All right. Back to our drawing here. What about the blood pressure? on the two circuits. So we know the cardiac output in the two circuits is, is equal. What about the blood pressure on the two sides? Arteries have more pressure or higher pressure. Well, so we're not talking about arteries because there's arteries on both the pulmonary and the systemic side. So I wanna know about the overall arterial blood pressure on the systemic circuit versus the pulmonary circuit. Systemic's gonna have a higher blood pressure. Say that again. Systemic is going to have a higher blood pressure because it needs to pump it throughout the body. Right, so it's kind of what I was talking about. Resistance can be affected by the length, total length of vessels. So on the Systemic side here, you have like, you know, four to five times the resistance. Compared to the pulmonary side, because you've got so many more miles of blood vessels to go to every little bit of the body. Um, which means if we go back to We go back to this equation right here. So we know that the flow, the cardiac output is going to have to be equal on the two circuits. But if my resistance is four to five times higher, that means the blood pressure is going to have to be four to five times higher as well in order to maintain the equal flow. So does, does that make sense? So because we know the flow is the same, the cardiac output is the same on the systemic and the pulmonary sides, in order for us to maintain that condition, given that we have a much higher resistance on the systemic side, we have to have a matched higher blood pressure to keep the flow going. So that makes sense? Cool, cool. All right, so now we're going to look at the heart itself in a little more detail. Actually, no, let's, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, um, no, no, I'll, I'll talk about the heart, and then we're going to come back to cardiac output. So cardiac output, we are not done with this at all. We're going to eventually see cardiac output has to do with 
we call the stroke volume, how much blood is getting squished out in a single beat times how much, how many beats per minute your heart's beating. Cardiac output is going to be something that we are going to look at because your body can control it by how fast your heart's beating. It can control it by how strong the heart muscle is contracting. And again, when we come back here, I was saying that blood pressure can be controlled by resistance, by changing the diameter of the vessels, which changes resistance. You can also control your blood pressure by affecting flow, the cardiac output. And your body can affect cardiac output in a bunch of different ways that we are going to see as we continue on. Um, by the time we're done, you're going to see all sorts of cool ways your body has to adjust blood pressure, both in the short term and the long term, both by adjusting resistance and by adjusting flow and using different um, strategies to adjust the flow. So it'll ultimately be fun. There's lots of moving parts, but they all start kind of linking together and usually linking together based on these fundamental relationships here. So I mean, my, I mean, my background was in engineering, so maybe I get more excited by this than you do, but I think it's just really pretty that these fundamental parameters all relate together in such a simple, straightforward way. And it's the same relationships that we're going to use when we look at the respiratory system. When we're looking at, you know, breathing, ventilation, the flow of air in and out of your lungs is going to depend on the pressure difference between inside and outside your lungs and resistance. Um, right? If you have asthma, if you have asthma, your airways are constricting, which is increasing resistance to flow of the air, which means you have to work harder to breathe to keep the flow, keep the air moving into your lungs. So when we get to the respiratory system, any kind of intuitions you're developing here are going to totally be helping you out when we look at flow of air instead of flow of blood. So just so you kind of don't feel like, oh, it's all going to be something new. It's like, it's, it's all kind of the same relationships, just in different contexts. So let's go back to the heart. Um, some things we should talk about. Um, have we talked about the idea of serous membranes in this class yet? I don't remember if we have. Peter? I don't think so. Okay, so if you think about your heart, it is going boom, 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 boom. It's pulsing literally, like we said, three billion times in your lifetime. You know, think about rubbing. It's going to totally rub raw. That friction is going to like be really bad if we don't have something in place to make everything really slippery and slidey so things aren't getting all friction and wearing themselves out. So the heart, as well as the lungs, as well as your digestive organs, are wrapped in this double layer membrane called serous membranes or serosa. Um, maybe let me define a serosa first and then we'll look at it at the heart in more detail in as a specific. Um, so serous membranes. So basically, you have an organ. And again, this organ might be it could be your heart, it could be your lungs, it could be your stomach and your intestines, it doesn't matter. For right now, let's just say it's your organ. 
Um, it's an, an organ inside your body. There's going to be one layer of the serous membrane that is on the surface of the organ. This is going to be called the visceral, visceral layer. It's just simple squamous epithelium. It's a very thin layer, epithelial layer. I'm going to have what we call the parietal layer. Parietal means close, closer to the body wall, right? So it's just out versus in. And then there is this really slippery fluid right in between called serous fluid. And it's slippery. Um, so hold on one sec. So here, I'm going to can kind of show you how this works. If I am going to stop sharing for a second. So you should just see me here. Here I have this thing that has two layers. It's, it's a Ziploc. Um, here I have some stuff that's slippery. I'm going to put some slippery, slippery stuff into here. And hold on, I'm, so I got two layers with slippery stuff inside. And now I can have my hand, like if I did not have this, if I just rubbing my hands like this, I am totally feeling the heat already as the friction. If I have this double layer with the slippery stuff in there, I could do this go on and on and on and on and on, and I'm not getting the friction, right? So this is what a serous membrane is like. It's this two really thin layers with the slippery stuff in there, but now my heart can keep beating or my lungs can inflate or deflate or my intestines and stomach can smoosh my food and they're not having this friction against each other. So that, that, that makes sense. Those are serous membranes. Um, other thing we should mention is that the space, yes, it's two different layers, but the space is really virtual. It's got some slippery stuff, but it's not like a big empty space in there. And in fact, when we get to the lungs, when we look at pulmonary ventilation, it's actually really important that there's this suction between the two. If I pull on one side, it doesn't come apart. They actually are sucked together because of the suction due to the fluid in between. So that suction between the two sides is going to be important when we get to the respiratory system. But for right now, it doesn't matter as much. So back to where we were. Um, I want to oops, share content. Oop. So that was, so everybody got a sense of um, serous membranes. So serous membranes 
They can also be called serose. Um, there's three main ones that you need to know. And I'll just use the typer tool. So pericardium is around the heart. That's the one that we're going to be talking about today. Um, there's the pleura around the lungs. And that we're going to talk about when we do the respiratory system. And then there's the peritoneum, which is around your digestive organs. So this is surrounding like your stomach and your intestines and your liver and stuff like that. So for right now though, we are gonna look at the pericardium around the heart. So there's the heart. There's going to be a layer that's right against the heart itself. It's going to be a visceral pericardium. Right, that's that inner layer of the serosa. Um, sometimes it's called the epicardium because it's kind of the outer surface of the heart. Um, doesn't, yeah. Then there's going to be this parietal pericardium. And the pericardium is a little different from the other serose in that the parietal layer has this fibrous kind of leathery reinforcement. So I'm kind of I'm trying to make it look like fibery as I'm doing this. So this is this fibrous, fibrous layer of this. So, you know, you can kind of think of it as kind of a kind of leather with a really slippery liner on it. So the heart is beating inside this leather bag, basically. This peric we call this the pericardial sac. So if you went and you cracked somebody's chest open, hoping just to see their heart there, you wouldn't. Instead, you would see this little leather bag with something obviously, you know, you know, pulsing inside it. Then you'd have to slit open the pericardial sac, slit open that little leathery bag to actually see the heart itself in there. And again, the reason this is here is because this, you got that serous fluid right in between the layers. So as the heart is beating, it's going to have that slippy slidey against the pericardial sac, the inside of the pericardial sac, so it's not rubbing against all the other structures in there. So is the pericardial sac all of those layers together? No, it's the fibrous layer and the parietal layer. Okay. Yeah, the visceral pericardium is on the heart itself on heart inside the bag. So basically the visceral layer on the outside of the heart is slippery and slidey against that parietal pericardium, which is inside the sac. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, if you get fluid buildup, normally, like I said, there's not really much space at all. It's just this thin layer of slippery stuff. It is, there is a medical condition where you get fluid buildup inside here, 
which obviously is going to be bad because it's going to compress against the heart and make it harder for the heart to fill properly. Um, if you have that condition, it's called cardiac tamponade. So cardiac tamponade is if fluid actually gets in between those layers and compresses the heart and makes it harder for it to fill properly. Um, so let's see, let's, yeah, maybe what we'll do now is it's getting, it's like 12, let's, let me talk about the very basics of the cardiac cycle and then we'll call it a day. Um, so let's do that. Right, so we had our atria, the right and left atria. We have the right and left ventricles. We had what we call the AV valves in between the atria and the ventricles. Atrioventricular, also called AV valves. Those are making sure that when the ventricles squeeze, you're not actually getting blood splishing back up into the atria, obviously. Um, they have different names. You should probably know their names. Uh, on the left, it's called the bicuspid valve or mitral valve. Yeah. On the right, it's called the tricuspid valve. Um, they get their names because of how many flaps they have to make them. To, it's, it's basically like little barn doors. The bicuspid valve, there's two flaps. You know, blood can go through. The, the flaps will fly down one way, but not the other way. Tricuspid valve will have three flaps. That's why it's called tricuspid valve. Again, but it's the same idea. The flaps will flap, flap from into the ventricle, but if you try to go back into the atrium, they slam shut and they don't go. Um, mitral valve gets its name because the hat that a bishop would wear is called a mitre, mitre. So he's like saying some blessing over you and he's got his mitre or his big vicious hat on. That's why it gets his name, mitral. Um, again, we also saw in our lab that there is the semilunar valves. Aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves. And those are 
basically like here. You know, this is making sure when there's, you have the diastolic pressure, right? When the heart is relaxing, the diastolic pressure is pushing back. You don't want that to get back up into the ventricle while it's relaxing. So the, this is gonna keep the blood that is in the arteries under some pressure from backflowing back into the ventricle. So that is kind of the layout for this whole thing. And now let's, what time is it? let's just put it all together. Sorry, Mr. Bishop. So it's gonna, I'm gonna just type it out because it's gonna be easier this way. So the first thing that's gonna happen is blood is returning to the heart. So when we start this here, the ventricles, and atria are in diastole. Remember diastole is relaxation. So here we're gonna have, you know, blood returning to the heart. Ventricles are filling. So as the blood is returning to the heart, most of it just kind of goes through the atria, kind of just falls in into the ventricles. So by the time the heartbeat is going to actually start, maybe like, you know, over 70% of the blood that's going to be in the ventricles is already in there. It's not like the blood goes into the atria first and then gets transferred into the ventricles. It's basically kind of flowing through the ventricles I mean, flowing through the atria. So I can maybe make sure blood flows through atria into, into ventricles. Now when the heartbeat is going to start, we're going to get the next thing. So then we're going to start the heartbeat. And the first thing that's going to happen is the atria contract. And what that's going to do is any last bit of blood that's still in the atria will get transferred down into the ventricles. Um, then we're going to see this in our lab next, next class. There's about a one to two tenths of a second delay. Then we're going to start ventricular systole. And this is going to have two parts. So when the ventricles first start squeezing, is the blood going to go anywhere? We talked about this a bit in lab. Anybody remember? When the ventricle starts squeezing, isovolumetric means same volume. They don't change the volume. How come when I first start 
my heartbeat here. I'm squeezing and squeezing. But the volume, no, the blood isn't going anywhere. Why is that? It hasn't reached the back pressure yet. Exactly. You have the diastolic pressure here that's pushing back. And in order for the blood to actually squeeze out into the aorta here, it actually has to have more pressure than the diastolic is pushing back or else the little valve flaps aren't going to swing open. So this isovolumetric contraction is when the ventricles are squeezing, but they still haven't built up enough pressure to overcome the diastolic pressure that's pushing back from the other side in the aorta or in the pulmonary arteries for that matter, pulmonary trunk. You know, two, you know, once, you know, once diastolic pressure is overcome, then you get what's called ventricular ejection. So that's when the blood is actually going out into the body. Um, we're gonna see as when we get when we start talking about stroke volume and cardiac output in our next class, we'll see at the end of ventricular ejection, it's not like every last bit of blood is gone. There's still a little bit of residual blood left out, even after it's squeezed as hard as it can, but it squeezes most of it out. So this is, when you hear that loop, 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 which again, we're going to look at in more detail next class, that loop, the first lub, that lub sound, loop is the AV valves slamming shut as you start the ventricular systole. As ventricular systole starts, the pressure builds up here, the blood wants to go back into the atria, but the AV valves slam shut. That's that lup. And then when the ventricles relax and go back into just this refilling. Now all of a sudden the diastolic pressure is going to want to get back up as the ventricles relaxed and the pressure in here goes down. The blood wants to come back, but the AV valve, the, I mean the semilunar valve slam shut. That's like that dup. These are the semilunar valves. So you know, so that lup sound, the first sound is when you have the AV valve slam shut as systole begins. And the dup is the sound and when systole ends and we enter diastole and the blood wants to come back in from the arteries, but it can't because the semilunar valve slam shut. And in terms of the timing of, the, of this thing, this part takes a lot more time. It spends most of its time in refilling. It's like refilling, boom, boom, push it out, refilling, boom, boom, push it out, refilling. So it's not like, you know, your heart is not like this going dun, 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 like a metronome. It's like going dun, dun, bump, 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 bump. So there's, there's a, a much longer period in between each that lupped up, waiting for the next lupped up, because it takes more time in this refilling. Um, so any comments, questions, or otherwise? You guys have had, we've all had a long day here. Um, all right. So 
I guess what I, I guess I will see you all on Wednesday morning for another exciting episode here of physiology and we'll again if we were in school for real it's actually a really fun lab because we literally stick electrodes onto your body and you can actually just like we saw the sarcolemma had depolarizations in skeletal muscle you have the cardiac muscle has depolarizations during the heartbeat, during the contraction. You can measure on your body the EKG. Um, um, Tina and Becky and I actually went in the lab and we filmed ourselves doing it. So you can see us doing it. Um, so we'll still do our lab, but it will be like a virtual lab. Um, but it will still be the EKG lab, which will be kind of cool, which is going to be looking at all of this. But how it shows up on the surface of your skin measured as voltages. So, um, on the schedule, it says that we have a quiz on Wednesday. Is that well, still true or? Um, yeah, let's still do that. Um, so let's, yeah, let me put that in here as well. All right. Yes, yeah, so it's just going to be a really simple little click through 10 point thing. You know, so it's, it's more just to kind of keep you guys, um, keep you guys kind of moving on all this stuff. <laughs>